welcome back to Cardiac Radio for Teens. For those of you who don't know, I'm Bia, and Cardiac Radio for Teens is a place where teens come together with other teens to learn about spiritist teachings and topics, because usually in school environments or in our normal community, we don't really come in contact with straight-up spiritist teachings all the time. So here we can meet with other teens that understand and think the same way as we do and learn together. We've been reading through the Spirits book together for several weeks now, and last week we left off topic, talking about progressive transmigration. And a thing with the Spirits book is that it goes in a certain order for a certain reason, because the knowledge that you get in the beginning helps you to move further along through the book. So if you do miss um, a show, if you do miss reading it a little bit, then try and go back and catch up because once you know what's before, it makes what's coming after, it makes a lot more sense because we need the background knowledge to keep learning deeper stuff. And this week, we're going to start off at a section that's called The Fate of Children After Death. And this, and this section starts off with question 197. Is the spirit of a child who dies very young as advanced as that of an adult? The spirits answered, Sometimes much more so, because the child may have had more existences, and may have therefore acquired more experiences, especially if he or she has progressed. So they're saying here, the question's asking, so children who die really young in this physical life, are they, in this corporeal life, are they as advanced spiritually as those of adults? And then they said, the spirits answered, that sometimes they're a lot more advanced because it doesn't really matter what our physical corporeal state is right now for this one life. It's our spiritual life and how many reincarnations we have and how many tries we've had and how many, how many things we've overcome. So our spirit, even though maybe look like a child right now, we could be very much more advanced than those who are look like adults right now. And then there's a part two to this question, and it says, Then can the spirit of a child be more evolved than that of its parents? And the spirits answered, That is very frequently the case. Haven't you yourself often witnessed it? So here the question was asking, So can the child, the spirit of the child, be more evolved and kind of more advanced than the parent? So not, of course, we know that the child still has to go through the basic stuff like the child needs to go to school and learn how to speak when the adult already knows how to do that and the child needs to learn how to walk and ride a bike and all that stuff when the adult already knows how to do that but morally and intellectually the children could be much more evolved than its parents and the spirit said that that's frequently the case and haven't you seen it when maybe the kids have much more moral standards than some adults or even their parents question 198 does the spirit of a child who dies very young without having done any evil belong to the higher degree and the spirits answered if such a child has done nothing evil it has also done nothing good god does not relieve such a spirit of the trials it must undergo if it is pure, it is not because it was a child, but because it was already advanced. So here the question they were asking, that when children die really young, and they didn't do anything wrong, because you think there's instances of two-year-olds who, who die, unfortunately. And so they're saying that they didn't do any evil. They were only one, one two. How they had, didn't do anything evil. So do they belong to a higher degree? Are they more evolved? And they said that if they didn't do anything wrong, then they also didn't have time to do anything right. So like a child that's one years old, they didn't have time to do anything. They didn't do anything wrong. They didn't have time to do anything wrong, but they also didn't really have time to do anything right either. So that doesn't mean that they're just because they're young children, they are very high above all of us. Because like it said, God does not relieve a spirit to to let go of your trials because if you have trials you need to overcome them he's not just gonna be like 
oh, you don't need to overcome this, never mind. And then, so if the child is pure, it's because they were already advanced. Like we were saying before, it's not just about what they look like right now, but their spirit, their soul, like how, like when people say that children have an old soul, it's because they, it's like they know so much that they've lived more incarnations. And although those people aren't really looking at it in a spiritual way, but we can look at it that way when you say you have an old soul, is that maybe you have more reincarnations and more experience learning, but in reality you're only a child. Well, in this corporeal life. Question 199. Why is life so often cut short in childhood? And then the spirits answered. The length of a child's life can be, for its spirit, the remainder of a former life that has been cut short due before its due term. Moreover, the death of a child is often a trial or an expiation for the parents. So here there, the question is asking, so why do we see so many cases of children who die young? If they haven't even had time to do good or bad, why was their life kind of taken away? So, for one, one reason why this can happen is that because something happened that kind of cut short their life last time, like, if we had a glass and it was full of water, and say that was the water that you had for your whole life, it was all your life energy, right, in that glass of water, so as time goes because you have a time that you we all have to die in this physical body so as time goes the cup gets gets emptier 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 and then eventually you just kind of run out a little bit so that's when you just kind of die in your sleep because it was just your time to pass away so your water just slowly slowly ran out but in cases such as suicide or something extreme like that then maybe your cup was still half full and you and you just ended it really quick but you still have that half cup so maybe you'll come back just to finish off that half cup so then you can start again so maybe that could be one reason because last your last incarnation you just cut it off really sh you just cut it off but you still had so much more to go so you kind of finish that off so maybe if you had seven years the child will die at seven or and all more often they said the death of a child is often it's often for the parents to learn maybe there's something that the parents had to go through and learn from that experience as well it's not just the it, it's not that all the children were did something bad that they are repaying now or something like that or all of them took their life or something terrible like that but it could just be for the parents beneficial for them to learn too that they have to learn something with this that happened. But of course we can't say that that applies to everything because everyone is a different case. We can't make it really cookie cutter and say, okay, this if they died at this age, it's because of this and this and this. There's various circumstances and there's so many spirits that everyone has a different story. But in general, those are the main two reasons why, why children die. And then there's a second part to this question, and it says, What becomes of the spirit of a child who dies very young? And the spirit said, It begins a new existence. So just because in this reincarnation they were a child and they died very young, they're going to go back to the, sp to the spirit world, and they're just going to start again and start the process and then reincarnate and then learn more. It's not really any different just because they're children. And then Alan Kardec puts his own comment, and he says, If humans had only one life to live, and it afterwards their fate were sealed for all eternity, why would half the human species, who die while very young, deserve to enjoy eternal bliss without having lived a fulfilled life? And by what right do they have to be exempt from the oft-so-painful conditions exposed on the other half? Such an order of things could not be accord with the justice of God. Through reincarnation, absolute justice is the same for all. The future belongs 
to all, without exception, and without favoritism, and those who arrive last will have only themselves to blame. Individuals must have the merit of their actions for which they are justly responsible. So right here what he's saying is that he's saying that it wouldn't make sense for if you die young, then you automatically get to go to heaven per se, and you just because you died young, you just don't have to do it, don't have to live through any of the other experiences as someone who died at the age of a hundred. If you died at the age of five and someone else died at the age of a hundred, they had to go through a lot more hardships and struggles and overcome a lot more than a five year old. So that wouldn't be fair for you to just jump to heaven while they are stuck going through all these trials that are often painful. So even if it's in this life, obviously there was a purpose for you to reincarnate and for that to happen and for you to die so young. And then you're going to have to come back and reincarnate again and keep improving yourself. It's not, it's not exactly like that song that says only the good die young because we're all just kind of the same. We're all just working towards our perfection. And that was something we needed to do for our perfection for that person needed to do for our perfection. And then after it's not like just because we were a child that died it's gonna be all perfect we're gonna have to continue progressing and going through trials and then alan kardec continues moreover it is unreasonable to consider childhood as a state of innocence do we not see children endowed with the worst instincts at an age at which education could not have ignited its influence what about those who seem to be born cunning, deceitful, and treacherous, who even harbor instincts for thieving and murder in spite of the good examples surrounding them? Criminal law absolves them when they commit mis misdeeds by considering them to have acted without discontentment, driven more by instinct than deliberate intent. But where do such instincts come from? which differ so widely among children of the same age, reared under the same conditions and subject to the same influences. Where does such preoccupious wickedness come from, if not from the imperfect nature of the spirit, since education has nothing to do with it? Those who are really wicked have progressed less and must therefore suffer the consequences, not of their actions during their present childhood, but of their previous lives. It is thus the law is the same, and that the justice of God extends to all. So here what they're saying is that just because they're, they're children, that doesn't mean that their spirit is, is so much more evolved. There could be, think about it, everyone, when we think of people who have done terrible things, they were all children at one point. So just because they're children doesn't mean they were completely innocent maybe in this life yeah they were just children but in their past lives they did something that they have to overcome now that they're working towards and some people like they're saying here that even before school even though they're surrounded in a good environment they have these this negativity surrounding them and work and bad instincts so that comes from previous lives and that's what they're trying to overcome but until they overcome that they might not be the best child or adult or teen or elderly or whatever it may be so just because it's a child is young that doesn't mean we can just say oh yeah they were perfect it was such a shame that they of course it is a shame that they were taken away because that devastates a whole bunch of people but it was for them to learn and for everyone around them to learn as well and now we're going to move on to the next part which is titled gender in spirits and question 200, are spirits male and female? The spirits answered, not as you understand it, because sex depends on organic composition. Love and sympathy exist among spirits, but they are based on the affinity of sentiment. So they're saying that, the, the question was asking pretty straightforward, are spirits male and female? Do we have just like on earth we have males and females, do we have male and female spirits? And they're saying not like us, because for us, what determines it is your physical body. 
but they say that love exists among spirits and it's based on sentiment it's based on just liking your characteristics it's not really about being male or female question 201 can a spirit who has animated the body of a man animate the body of a woman in a new existence and vice versa and the spirit said yes since the same spirit can animate both male and female bodies so if you're a female on this existence right now the next reincarnation you can be in a male body or you can come back as you can be a female for five incarnations because maybe there's something that you have to overcome with being a female and then there'll be another trial that it's better if you're a male it's just it's just kind of like our clothes. Our corporeal body is just kind of the clothes that our spirit wears so that we can overcome trials and face new things. Question 202. When we are spirits, do we have a preference as to whether we will incarnate into a male or a female body? The spirits answered, It matters little to a spirit. It depends on the trials it must undergo. So here again, that's kind of what we were saying before. So the question was asking, so when we're spirits, when we're kind of planning out, okay, we need to try and overcome this and this and this. I want to go back and try and do this. Do you get to pick like, oh, I want to be male. I want to be a female. And they said that for the spirit, it doesn't really matter. So it more depends, like we were saying, on the trials that you have to undergo. If you have to undergo the trials of being a loving and supporting mother then obviously you have to come as a female or vice versa or if it was maybe back in the days when only when only males had any power and women were basically a rock and you had to do a trial of having power then maybe you were you had to come as a male so it was just depending on the trials that you have to overcome not just like picking oh I just want to be a girl this time I want to be a man this time and then Alan Kardec puts his own comment in, and he says, Because they are sexless, spirits can incarnate as either men or women. Since they must progress in every way, each sex, like each social position, offers them special trials, duties, and new opportunities to acquire experiences. The one who always incar incarnates as a man would only know what men know. So what they're saying is that the goal here is to reach perfection, like we've been saying this whole time, that we have to overcome all these trials and all these tests so that we can move up and perfect ourselves. So if you're only ever a man, then you're not going to know, like we were saying, being a mother or maybe being a nun or something of that matter because those are women. Or maybe just even being, a, you just have to experience being a wife or a female teacher or even the same job but as a female could be completely different than a man so you have to experience both to be able to go through all the tests and trials just like you have to go through all social positions you have to be you have to have a trial when you're wealthy but you also have to have a trial of being poor or being in the middle class and all in between and that was it for that little part and that that was a really short part and the next one is kinship and affiliations so this is kinship is like your kids and your family so parents and their kids so question 203 do parents tra transmit a portion of their soul to their child or do they give them only animal life to which a new soul afterwards adds the moral life and the spirits answered only animal life, since the soul is invisible. Daft parents may have intelligent children, and vice versa. So what they're saying here is that on when on like Earth, when on a physical bot on a physical planet like we are right now, then the parents they only give the child the physical body. They don't it's not like you give part of your spirit to make a new spirit the spirit is not being made only the the physical body as we know right here like on earth so only the animal life as they call it 
And they say that's why we see that sometimes daft, which they're kind of saying like dumb, not that smart parents, can have really smart children, and the opposite. Really smart parents can have children who are not that intelligent. So it's not like it's the same spirit, but it's just, that's why it's like, more of your physical qualities are the same as your parents, but not exactly all your thoughts and all your morals and all that. Question 204. Since we have had many existences, does kinship go back to previous ones? And the spirits answer, it could not be otherwise. The succession of corporeal lives establishes ties among spirits dating back to former existences. Such frequently gives rise to the affinity between you and some spirits who you might think you are strangers. So they're saying that does like kinship, which is your parent having your children, those children. So so what the question is asking is, does it go back for other reincarnations, like having the same parents, having the same children, that kind of thing? Does that go go for many existences and they said that it couldn't be otherwise because the success although corporeal life ends we still are very attached to these people and that's why sometimes when you might like they say right here frequent affinity between people who are, might be strangers to you but you meet them and you like wow I think like I know you or you just get along really well and just clicks really fast It might be because you were, in another life, really connected together. Maybe in one life you were brothers, in the next you were best friends or mom. It could change a little bit, but you are very close. You do keep ties as a spirit, even though you corporally disincarnate from this existence. Question 205. According to certain individuals... The doctrine of reincarnation appears to destroy family ties by carrying them back to previous ones. So that wasn't really a question. That was kind of a statement. And they were kind of, basically the question is asking, some people think that it destroys family ties. So they're asking the spirits, like, what do you think about this? And the spirit said, instead of destroying them, it extends them. Since kinship may be based on previous affections, the ties that unite members of the same family are less precarious. Moreover, reincarnation broadens the duties of fraternity because your neighbor or your servant may be a spirit who was formerly related to you by blood. So this is what we were kind of mentioning before about how it doesn't destroy family because just because you're not going to come back as the same mom, dad, brother, sister family you will be together. And that's like what we were saying before. Maybe it'll be, instead of being your brother, it'll be your best friend. Or instead of being your mom, it'll be a teacher or someone very close to you. Or even like they said, maybe it was your servant or your neighbor. So it's not going to completely destroy family ties. And then there's a second part to this question, and it says, It does, however, diminish the importance that some attached to their family affiliations because their father may be a spirit who has previously belonged to a different race or whom had occupied a much different social position. And the spirits answered, That is true, but such is, such importance is founded on pride. What most people honor in their ancestors are titles, class, and fortune. They would blush if they had an honest shoemaker for a grandfather, but would boast if they had descended from the Debaiki of noble birth. No matter what people say or do, they will not prevent things from being what they are, for God does not regulate the laws of nature according to their vanity. So what they're saying is that it does it doesn't destroy family ties like we just established, but it diminishes the importance of because they're saying like maybe like when there was slavery and someone who was a slave because obviously you have to learn with that person if it's something needed for you then maybe they could come back as your father as a close family member and they'll look like 
completely white or maybe you'll be in that slave category too so that kind of destroys people's pride in saying that they come from like an all italian background but really maybe in a different reincarnation you were african maybe in a different reincarnation you lived in the united states maybe in a different reincarnation you were indian so it kind of destroys that but they're saying that that only really matters the spirit said based on your pride so if you have too much pride that's when it matters because it's like when people boast that their their great 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 grandfather's cousin was the queen of it was the queen of england like that doesn't matter it's only pride that we're boasting so none of that truly matters and god's laws are evolved around people's pride in themselves Question 206. Since there may be no actual affiliation among the spirits of a particular family's descent, would it be foolish for members to honor their ancestors? The spirit said, Assuredly not, because they should feel happy belonging to a family in which more highly evolved spirits have incarnated. Although spirits do not proceed from one another, they have no less affection for those who are linked to them by family ties for they are often attracted to this or that family because of affinities or previous connections. You may be sh very sure that the spirits of your ancestors do not feel honored at all with the respect you render them out of pride. Their merits do not benefit you except as you strive to follow their moral examples. Only in the way that your memories not only be pleasant but even useful to them so the question was saying then would it be weird to like honor your ancestors if really you don't even know who they truly were like as a spirit and they're saying no that it's good to it's good to feel happy to be part of a specific family and the important thing is that we're not gonna like to say like you could have not so smart parents but be really smart or the opposite, just because maybe they were really smart doesn't mean you have to be really smart, but, and it doesn't mean you are going to be really smart, but it's a good way for you to strive to do good. It's like you have a role model to look up to. So that's the way we should look at it. Instead of just thinking, oh, if they were great, then I'm great too. So that's where we'll leave off today. And then next week, we're going to pick up on the section that's called physical and moral likeness. But before we leave off today, I'd like to read our daily book of positive quotations for today's date, March 21st. Friends Recognition The best mirror is an old friend. Those who have known us the longest can tell us the truth about ourselves, even when it's the truth we might not want to hear. They see us clearly, the good and the bad, and they recognize when they are being phony or overly impressive with ourselves. We need to see our true selves reflected this way. I'm lucky to have longtime friends who know me and aren't f afraid to tell me the truth about myself. I'm Bia. Thank you all for listening. This has been Cardiac Radio for Teens. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>